Well, good morning, Greater Life. What a privilege to be here with you today, and I've been looking forward to an opportunity when I could come and share in a beautiful new space that God's provided, and it's a miracle, and uh, we give you praise, give Him praise and thanks, and uh, I give you thanks for your faithfulness and your obedience and your tenacity and your perseverance, and I don't know every other uh, adjective that could describe what it's taken to get here, but uh, God is faithful, and uh, we continue to give Him thanks, and and praise for that. Uh, Rosie and I will be, as uh, Pastor stated, uh, retiring in uh, the first of August. And what a great, what a great journey this has been. Uh, I could not have, if I had have defined and described what I wanted uh, ministry to look like for me, the wonderful places I've served, but to have had the privilege of spending the last almost decade, the last season of uh, professional assigned ministry. Ministry isn't over when I retire, but uh, where I've had an actual official uh, assignment with the Church of the Nazarene, I could not have imagined uh, the opportunity that God has provided for us to develop and have friendships and serve with the pastors and the churches. And your pastor is uh, one of my heroes. We've had a great friendship over the years and uh, just have loved and I've learned from him and uh, his contribution that he's made to the district, not just in my time, but through his whole tenure in ministry here. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. You know, I imagine most of us, uh, when we get up every morning uh, and begin the day, expect it without exception to be fairly routine. Uh, most of us have our, our calendars, day timers. We, uh, we, we kind of have an expectation of what today's going to look like. I mean, it's another Sunday, right? You got up, same old routine, you know, three cups of coffee, uh, get dressed, sit around for a while, make the drive, get here, sing and worship together, pastor preaches, you go out for lunch, you go home, maybe take a nap, and I don't know what you do, but, but it's pretty routine, pretty predictable most of the time when we get up in the morning. No expectation for any surprises happening, but occasionally surprises happen, right? Things when we, at the end of the day, go, I didn't see that coming. I, I wasn't expecting that. Now, a lot of things that happen in life, we can prepare for. Uh, a lot of things we prepare for never really are realized, for instance, Rose and I have been on a number of cruises, and we love to go. And if you've been on a cruise, you will remember that the first item of business when a cruise begins is everybody gathers at the muster stations. Now, I'd never heard that term before until I got on. I kept thinking they were saying mustard stations and thought they were serving hot dogs or something. I didn't know. But muster is a gathering place. So the first item on a cruise is... They send you to certain that's gathering places on the ship in the event they have a crisis on the ship and you have to abandon ship in the middle. They show you where the lifeboats are at, talk you through. I, I, it's comforting, I guess, except that I'm assuming that most of the people that are giving direction have never been on a never been on a ship where they had to abandon it. They're just reading the script. But, you know, they're helping to prepare, and I respect that. And, uh, you know, most people, and myself included, are ready to kind of, yeah, 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 after the first time, let's, let's get to the pool, let's uh, do something. Every time you get on an airplane, they go through the same routine, right? It's kind of like uh, the person's up there doing this and that. You glance up every once in a while, and they direct you in an event of an emergency. But, you know, that kind of hardly ever happens, at least I haven't hasn't happened on any air flights that I've been on. Maybe your story is different. Storm season, they're going to begin telling you now, every night on the news, whichever channel you watch, if you have a storm, you hear it coming, don't wait. Find shelter immediately and uh, stay tuned to our station and we'll, we'll coach you through it. And around here, some of you probably have been through some of those or at least some close calls and you can respect the preparation, but no one really expects that to be their reality until the end of the day, and maybe it happens, and they go, I didn't, I didn't really see that one coming. 
that day that everything changed in my life. Several years ago, I went on a folk trip with my son, a whitewater rafting trip, and uh, one of those father-son outings. It was great. We'd planned it and planned it, and we got it down in southeast Tennessee on the Coe River. And uh, we got there that day, and uh, it was just the water was, you could hear it raging down the river. And where, where, we, where we got into the uh, rafts at was with eight or ten other people we got. And uh, when we got there and got our, our names all counted and everybody told us, you know, we're with this group and this, they, they give, us, give us our paddle, and they give us our life jacket, and then they gave us our helmet. And I thought, a helmet? <laughs> I'm going on a folk trip, for heaven's sakes. And we, they say, put your helmet on, tighten it up. Here's your paddle. We'll give directions. Make sure your life jack's secure. Make sure your swimsuits are all tight on, very, very tight, because in the unlikely event that you fall in a river, the river always takes what it wants. So, so prepare for the hopefully... Uh, not inevitable experience. We get in the raft, and and uh, he sits down and goes through, and he says, now one last thing. He says, now this, this, this never, hardly, it's rapid. Listen carefully. Don't panic. Stay calm. Be relaxed. And the river will take you where the river wants you to go. Now, that, that didn't sound particularly promising, but, you know, that's one of those kind of like, just kind of helps that they give you on an airplane in the unlikely event, you know. And so, yeah, so we get on the rip. We go, and it's fun. It's got some uh, level three and four rapids in this. So we get pretty. So we got to one place, and the, uh, the uh, tour guide who had given us, or the, the rap, uh, the captain of the raft there, uh, the guide, river guide, he gets us going in circles, and we're going, he's doing it on purpose, there's an eddy there, and he gets it spinning around, and I was rather enjoying this experience, it had been uh, pretty mild up to this point, and so I'm reaching out, and I'm, I'm splashing some water with my hand, and I'm leaning out a little bit farther, and then a little bit further, and all of a sudden, just when this, this raft had been zigging along just fine, all of a sudden it does a zag. And, and I, I don't know what happened, except that I was in the water. And it was, it was rather like being in, if you could imagine this, because you've all been here, in a washing machine. Being tumbled and turned and tossed and, and disoriented and not knowing and uh, knowing you're holding your breath and just the water, the air doesn't come to the surface and it's just tumbling and, and, and getting a little panicked to be honest with you. And then I, in the back of my mind, I remembered what the guide said. In the unlikely event that you would fall into the river, don't panic. Lay back and relax, and the river will take you. Well, I'm glad I heard that instruction. Because as best as I could, I got my composure and I just quit fighting the water because I was trying to swim my way out of this thing. And, and there just wasn't any swimming out of it because I didn't even know which direction I was oriented toward. But when I relaxed, I felt the current begin to move me. And, it carried, and, and I don't know, 20, 30 yards, maybe to here to the front of the building, suddenly my head, I popped up out of water and I heard everybody going, there he is! <laughs> I was glad they missed me. And I began to calm down. They came down and got me. First thing I did, I got up and looked, make sure my swimsuit was still on. And uh, it was. And I thought, wow, I'm so glad I had that direction. Because I'm not sure what that would have been like. I don't know what you are expecting or anticipating. But I expect there has been or will be one of those I didn't see that coming moments in your life. And as followers of Jesus, disciples, we are not exempt from those 
I didn't see that coming. Even sometimes when our own daringness causes the problem that we're in, or either it's been thrust upon us by someone else's carelessness, or just life happens, as disciples of Jesus, we are not exempt from finding ourselves in those tumbling, tumultuous moments that, that take our breath and leave us feeling like we're probably going to not survive this event. And as disciples of Jesus, I, I would say to you, as for, just as we begin to get to our scripture, our, our testimony to God's faithfulness is tested in those times of fearfulness. I, I, I could say I trust the Lord, and we do, and we should. It should be a part of our, lit, our liturgy as, of life. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. We say it loud. We say it long. We say it often. But our testimony to that is proven and tested out in those times of fearfulness. And it doesn't matter what it is. Don't compare your your turmoil with mine, it's all relative, you know. Uh, your hangnail is worse than my hangnail. It just doesn't matter. That's not what we're here today to talk about, well, anybody can survive that because not necessarily anybody can. And so the scripture this morning that uh, I want to share with you, I think it gives us some, some guidance uh, through how we are going to navigate our way through these times, and uh, if you'll turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 8. It's a story that we're familiar with that you've read, if if you've read the Word as a follower of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 8, there's this this story of Jesus in the boat with his disciples, and it begins at verse 23. It says, And then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves And it was completely calm. The men were amazed. Amazed. And they asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Would you pray with me? Father, would you take this familiar passage of Scripture, one that we've heard Many times. One we've been alerted to that this perhaps is an event of emergency, how you respond. But may one more time this morning your spirit help us to grasp, embrace, and take into our spirit this clear direction. So that in the moment in time, if such an event happens in our lives, we will hear this trustworthy guide speaking into our spirit, saying, this is the way. This is the way. In Jesus' name, amen. So this journey begins in our life of following Jesus, right? The disciples were invited to follow Jesus. And they were invited into this boat, and into this boat that was on a mission. It was going somewhere. If you read the end, you'll see that Jesus had a destination in mind for these disciples, and there would be a teaching moment at the end. And sometimes we miss the teaching moments in the middle as we anticipate, well, where is this boat going when I get there? But Jesus is doing as much teaching and helping us to navigate life in the middle of some difficult places as he is when we hope that we get through them where we can really do something for Jesus. And so here's the disciples. The Bible says, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. It was an expectation, I think, of a beautiful day on the lake. A beautiful day with Jesus, just the 12 of them, just out 
cruise and have been on the Sea of Galilee, and it it's, can be calm and serene, but just like that, it can also become a very different place. And here's these disciples, not expecting that for that day, not even asking where are we going, just following. Do you remember that kind of uh, alluring obedience that you had when you began to follow Jesus and you said, I just want to follow him? I, it doesn't even really matter to me where we're going. I just want to follow him. And that's, that's, I think, the spirit that perhaps is, is being portrayed in this passage of Scripture. Just take us somewhere as long as we're with you. It's all going to be okay. But I wonder if they knew then what they knew afterwards, if they would have still stepped into the boat. I think that's a challenge for us at times is if you, and obviously you're still here, and, I, and I'm assuming that you've had some very challenging times in life, and you're still here. But look around. There are folks who haven't made the journey when they stepped into the boat and follow, and those times came, and, and it was more about the destination than it was the journey. And they didn't experience the fullness and are not today perhaps experiencing the fullness of God because somewhere along the way they, they kind of lost their way. But that's not you. You're here. And as you go forward, Jesus calls us to, to continue to stay, continue to stay focused on him, more on the journey than the destination. As, as a young pastor and a young leader and, and as someone who was always just just ready to make it happen wherever I was at. Much of my, my ministry, I, I look back, and this is a confession, I was more focused on the destination than I was the journey. And let's just, let's just dismiss all this, this tough stuff going on. There's nothing to learn in this. Nobody needs this. You know, nobody has time for this. Let's go, but as I've walked with Jesus a lot of years, I've learned that I can't avoid those places, and it's in those places where the greatest lessons about who Jesus is and who I am with him that I've, I look back in reflection now a lot, and, and, and I, I learned from what I didn't learn back then to prepare me, I think, for the boat that I'm in now and where it's going and I mean, and that's that was the disciples as they were there. But when they started that morning, they never expected anything different than just a nice boat ride on a placid lake with their new best friend and teacher and rabbi Jesus. And feeling rather special, I suppose, because they were called. And then, without warning. And that phrase always captured me. Without warning. A furious storm. Not just, not just a, a, a little uh, windstorm blow in and little discomfort. A furious storm came on lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Over the boat. It's that moment in life when the peace and tranquility and the hopefulness and the forthright that you've been enjoying suddenly gets disrupted by something furious, something out of your control, something that's tearing at you and, and, and you feel like it's trying to rip you apart without warning. If I'd have seen it come and I, I would have put my seatbelt on, I would have buckled in, I would have held on a little tighter, I would have maybe said, hey, let's don't take the journey today, there's, there's a storm, but, but we just don't always have that advantage. And without warning, it came, this unexpected crisis, a furious storm. And I'm trying to get my mind around this, like, what is going on? This makes no sense. It's beyond comprehension, and the waves begin to sweep over the boat. It's one thing when stuff's pushing up against you. It's another thing when it's overtaking you. And, and you are literally in fear 
that I will not perhaps survive this moment financially, physically, emotionally, whatever that is, spiritually, that it, it is so intense that you just kind of doubt that you're even going to be able to get out of this boat without the worst happening. They swept over the boat. And in the midst of that, they did what, what any of us would do. They're looking for someone that can help them. And that someone was Jesus. And they start looking around. And they're asking the question, where's Jesus in the middle of all of this, right? Well, he's over there, but he's asleep. Does he not know what's going on? Has he, is he dismissive of this, this whole crisis that is happening right now? And they look for him, and they, the word says, verse 24, but Jesus was sleeping. How, how's that possible? How is that possible that Jesus isn't wringing his hands and going, oh, guys, look, I don't know if we're going to get out of this or not. I, I have my concerns. If I'd known we were going to get in this, we would have never taken off from shore. And he's experiencing and demonstrating total tranquility in the middle of a furious storm. Jesus was. The disciples weren't. Jesus was. Just sleeping like a baby. And they're thrown in, into the fiery furnace. And it's one of those things as they're being bound and thrown. It's kind of like, I didn't see this coming. The day didn't start like this. The year didn't start like But now here we are in this. And, and you know the story without, without walking all the way through it. And, and, and Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the fiery furnace, right? And Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet. And in amazement... He asked his advisor, weren't there three men that we tied and threw into the furnace? Yes, there were three men that we threw to their death. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. In the most intense firefight of their life, he was present. Something the world didn't understand. They couldn't get their mind around or their brain around. But they came out of that unscathed with a powerful testimony that our God is more powerful than any fire you can throw at us. Our God is, is more powerful than any storm that can come our way. And Paul writes in Philippians, I, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, the story of Jesus. And when we as followers of Jesus can begin to embrace that reality that whatever has happened to you, whatever is happening to you, whatever will happen to you, will serve to advance the story of Jesus and His faithfulness. But they were still afraid, right? And Jesus woke up. Stretched, I imagine in my mind, this is the way I see it. Saying, oh, a little bit of wind going on here today, boys. And they're in their spirit going, yeah, like where you been? Do something. And he said to them, I like this, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Okay, now I've heard this all my life. And I think it, at first reading of this, our tendency would be for this to be kind of a shaming statement. Like, you have little faith. Where's your faith? You ought to be, you ought to be a big girl, Deb. I mean, you ought, to, you ought to be over this now, Pastor Lee. Where's your faith, man? Haven't you seen me do it? Ye of little. And, and it, it can kind of become feeling like a rebuke. 
or shaming, but, but I really, have, over my journey, have come to see that that's not what's happening here in this. That in the midst of the storms of my life, Jesus speaks to me, and basically he's saying, you know, here's a time for your faith to grow a little more. Not that you don't have any. There's just room for more growth right here. And, and, and you haven't been here before, have you, Kim? No. No, I didn't see this coming today. No, I hadn't been here before. And so I know that your, your faith can't show that because you've, you, you've just not seen that. Have you? No, I haven't. And I've learned that great faith, growing faith, is only developed in the midst of tragedy and trial and temptation and brokenness. And the Lord comes along and says, "Not, oh, why don't you have more faith? He's saying, look, I get it. Your faith hasn't grown to this yet. But stay with me and it will. Stay with me and it will. And so the question in that becomes for me to ask myself, what is happening inside of me? What am I afraid of right now? And I come to terms in moments like that with my own lack of self-sufficiency. My own absolute inability to be able to control what's going on around me, and that's a tough one for people who like to be in control. But it brings us deep into our inner being. When I can't even control the ship and the boat that I've been a master at all my life in fishing. I can't even control what I know how to control. but he's in present. At the end of the day, I have to go, I can't, and trust that he can. And once they've had this little talk with Jesus, and I, I think I see that passage as, a, as an encouraging and a comforting and kind of saying, let's talk. What, what, what is it? What is it that you're afraid of right now? Not like I'm ashamed of you because you don't have enough faith. You shouldn't be, no, what is it that you're, let's talk about it, Kim. What is it that's just got you so unnerved right now? And I say, well, I, the oars that I know how to use on the boat, I, it, it, the boat won't go where I want it to go. And then something powerful happens. It says, and then he got up. This indicates to me at this point he's never even got up. He's just, he's just laying down. And they're all frantic and, 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 and just ready to jump ship, and, and he's just kind of laying down. Kind of like, okay. And he got up, and he rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was, get this, completely calm. When's the last time you had a sense of complete calm in your life? Complete calm, not just, yeah, I'm okay, I'm just, but I'm still a little nervous and anxious about this. I'm, we're completely calm. For from, from this tumultuous storm, furious storm, to the waters as smooth and calm as the top of this altar. Well, when's the last time you could testify and say that's, that's where I've been. That's where I am maybe today. Completely calm. And he got up to deal with the storm that was going on around them only after he had dealt with the storm that was going on within them. First things first. First things first. Because, listen, life's going to be full of storms. And the only thing that can be calm in the midst of them is you. 
You, you can't calm the storms. I mean, they're, but it was completely calm. And, and I see that as much as a metaphor of, of what was happening in them. They're kind of like, wow. Completely calm. Our peace that we have in life is not, it comes in the presence of Jesus. It comes in the presence of Jesus as we've ridden in the boat and been through a few storms. It's this sense of even the disciples sensed after post-resurrection. You remember the story it's, as we're approaching Holy Week and, and, and Easter and, and the crucifixion and, and, and the, the storm that was blowing. And the disciples going, I didn't see this coming. He, I mean, he prepared us for it. He's trying to tell us this was going to happen. But, but who knew that it was going to be this intense and this violent? And, and, and Jesus was crucified and he was... Buried, dead, not just asleep, he was dead. The storm had taken his humanity. And on Easter, we know the story we're celebrating a couple weeks. He rose again. But the disciples still were in fear. And then they gathered in an upper room in another boat in a sense. And they're all in this, uh, this, this upper room and they're, they're trying to figure out how we're going to row our way out of this. This storm is still blowing. It's still blowing. How do we get through this? It's, it's in a sense as if they were in their own tomb that morning. They were all dead and desensitized to the reality of what had happened. Right? How do we go forward? Will we survive this? Are we next? Where's Jesus? In that powerful moment, that dramatic moment, he slips into the room, awakened from his sleep. And, his, and he says, Peace, be still. Peace. And the peace of Jesus came into that room for everyone that was there. But not everybody's always on the boat when he's speaking peace, right? And so Thomas shows up later. And Jesus doesn't withhold his peace from him either. He comes and says, yes, there was a storm. And you're a part of it and you're still there. And I understand your fear, but, but peace to you, Thomas. And here we are this morning. How do we navigate that? I, I just learned more and more to trust in the grace of, of God to meet us in those times. And the peace of God that passes, Paul says, it's the peace of God that passes all understanding. I can't even comprehend how God in his heart, the experience that he has, and I will be faithful. One of my favorite songs, worship songs, on the radio today is all my life he has been faithful. All my life he has been faithful. All of my life the goodness of God. I've seen his goodness visit a dying saint one day who came to the end of her godly journey and was laying in a hospital bed under hospice care in the very last stages of terminal cancer. And I walked into Jean's room that day as a pastor so inept, so no, not even knowing what to say. I'm a problem solver. That's who I am. That's what I do. That's what I've kind of been paid to do all my life in ministry besides just walking and teaching. And, and, and I couldn't even speak into this storm she was having because first place I hadn't been there and two, the ship was about to go down. My minister of music was with me. 
His name was R.G. Boone. Had a beautiful, melodic voice. As I stood there and saw her in pain, not even knowing how to pray, the Spirit of God spoke into my spirit and says, Have Pastor R.G. R.G. Sing the old hymn, Blessed Assurance. That'll resonate with her spirit, perhaps. Pastor R.G. began to sing that first verse, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is my way. I wish I could sing like him. I'd just sing it. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God. I've been born in his spirit. I'm washed in his blood. And she just lay there, the storm waging and no expression on her face. She was looking and just trying to nod. And he sang that chorus, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Then he started in the second verse. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. I saw her begin to waken a little. She began to see angels descending. I saw her eyes come wide open. Bringing from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. And he sang that chorus again. This is my story. And then he went to the third verse. And she roused up. And she tried to sing as best she could. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior and happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And he said, peace be still. And the waves calmed. And it's that moment when we say, I didn't see that coming either. <laughs> One thing to say, I didn't see the storm coming, but I have to confess to you. In the middle of the storm, when he's spoken, the disciples said they were amazed. I said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see the peace of God coming in the midst of the storm that I'm in. I didn't see that. I didn't see the storm, but I certainly didn't expect and see that. And here it is. It is so calm and peaceful in this. What an amazing moment that his grace speaks and restores my peace and rebukes my storms. And regardless of what's happening in my life right now, what's happening in your life right now, what will happen to me to demon possess them. They perhaps stepped on the shore. And with confidence, say, don't worry, my friends, Jesus is here. And whatever storm has brought you to that place, here's the one who can bring calm.